morning, good evening and good afternoon. Thanks a lot for joining my session for this uh, <coughs> MariaDB Fest and uh, hopefully it's going to be like an interesting half an hour. We're going to talk about um, an interesting topic that uh, I've been researching lately. It's called Supply Chain Attacks. And I hope, I hope you'll find it interesting and um, pretty, pretty um, resourceful. My name is Dan Dimitar. I'm part of uh, Kaspersky's Global Research and Analysis Team, um, in short grade. We focus on um, attacks which are, let's say, let's call it uh, advanced, and um, you might have heard about like uh, APTs, Advanced Persistent Threats. Um, me and myself and my colleagues, we are um, almost like 40 plus experts in uh, 20 different countries, and we're mostly doing uh, threat intelligence and um, <coughs> research. As I mentioned before, we are focusing on um, advanced persistent threats, on uh, attacks, attacks against banks, governments, banking, banking institutions, of course, and financial threats as well. And we also uh, monitor the current threat landscape. And whenever there's like a large scale attack, we are ready, we are there to uh, identify, to research, reverse, and publish our results. You might have heard of some of our research. Um, we started um, in our more than 10 years um, existence. We started, we published a lot of um, research and uh, some of them you might have heard about, like for example, Stuxnet or Dukyo or Flame. Uh, my favorite um, would be like Equation and Satellite Store Lab. And this is all the research we've done in the past, um, let's say, 2000 and 2016. And you might ask, hey, Dan, why isn't the research from 2020 here uh, or from 2019? Well, it's because it won't fit in a screen. If we, we are monitoring and we are like uh, checking more than 900 operations and groups. And um, this was only in the last year. 20 of them are commercial ones. So what do I mean what do I what do I mean by commercial? Basically there are groups which are financially motivated. They just want to get money. They're not like um, interested especially in um, cyber espionage in uh, like stealing data. No, they, they just want to get money. And uh, the question is like how do they get some money? How do they uh, steal money? Well, they deploy ransomware attacks, which are like huge, quite popular these days. They do extortion. They um, they do like a sphere spishing, a phishing, and all this kind of stuff. Um, also, we monitor um, over from those 900 operations and groups. We notice that 25 of them are Chinese speaking, which is a lot, and um, this trend. Unfortunately, it seems that uh, it start, starts to increase with um, more group, groups from um, same regions or same, uh, same geographic area, areas. They compete with each other, trying to steal and trying to infect and get access to networks. So, I would like to um, like show you just a glimpse of um, the research and the things that we are doing. And um, basically, the idea is that we cannot research or we cannot do everything by, our, by ourselves. And 80% um, of the malware that we see currently in the wild, fresh malware, malware we, we might say, is actually crimeware. It's like a petty theft, small crimes, keyloggers, um, maybe some. Um, some Trojans, some remote administration tools, you know, people just trying to steal some credentials or to steal some of your money or like, uh, like banking Trojans, etc. Those are like automatically detected and not so interesting. Then we have like targeted attacks, which are like 19.9%. Um, 19, 19 um, those targeted attacks are like uh, more advanced, they require more prepping time, and the attackers uh, actually they do their homework when they try to infiltrate your network, they um, research a bit about their, their victims, and then only when they have the information they launch the attack. 
And then lastly, we have 0.01% of the attacks, um, which are like advanced, advanced persistent threats. And those are the ones which are like juicy, I might say, or like interesting for, for, for my group. And those attacks are um, the ones that are like um, extremely dangerous and with a big impact. You might have heard about like a huge ones. So for example, um, solar winds, which we will be focusing on a little bit later. These kind of attacks are like uh, really advanced and we um, analyze them. It takes us like from weeks to months to actually fully understand the attack and write a report from them. But of course, we cannot do everything by ourselves. So we have like a lot of robots, we have a lot of data. And um, with this occasion, I would like to thank from, from our hearts, like uh, thank you um, all the developers, all the people from our ADB Foundation, mostly because we run Linux um, on our systems and we are using um, for our relational databases, we are using MariaDB, which is like a super cool software and uh, we like it a lot, it's really stable and it helps us in our day-to-day -day life in order to do research. So thank you very much and thank you for um, giving me this opportunity to come and meet and greet, and, and greet you and uh, <coughs> hopefully we'll do some more collaboration in the future. Now. Of course, um, before we talk about um, supply chain attacks, I would like to give you a short introduction of the current threat landscape, what's out there, what's happening, and like just to put you out, up to speed of what's been happening in the last um, year, we're almost like in uh, Q4, and we've seen, based on, our, based on our telemetry, based on our knowledge, we've seen that more and more network appliances are being targeted by the attackers. So in the past, it used to be only like uh, Windows platforms, maybe a little bit shy of uh, Mac OS platforms, and like not so much on Linux, malware we've seen. But nowadays, more and more devices are being attacked, especially routers, which are like home routers, or like small office software routers. We've seen like a VPN, VPN networks, um, VPN appliances being targeted like um, last week or two weeks ago. Um, there was a huge dump of like more than half a million Fortinet um, devices which were hacked and for half a million Fortinet accounts which were leaked. I found um, a lot of, um, let's say, governmental uh, institutions in the leak as well and uh, attackers were exploiting a zero day in the Fortinet in order to dump the users and the passwords. And let's think about it. It's pretty, pretty like, um, <coughs> obvious or pretty um, clear that attackers, especially in these times of uh, re remote working and um, more and more people are uh, like working from home instead of in the office, VPN gateways are um, a safe passageway through the corporate network. If you manage to own the gateway, then you are able to actually get into the, to the network. If you manage to compromise access from one user, maybe you do like some spear phishing, maybe you you do some social engineering, and then you meet somebody from the from the victim um, company, victim like victim company. You meet meet that person in at the bar, and then you manage to that person basically the attacker steals the laptop, and then manages manages to access the credentials. Basically, <coughs> VPN is a way into the company's network. Also, social engineering and vishings are vishing attacks are also uh, pretty popular these days. Now, when we talk about like um, APT attackers, um, we've seen that instead of like wasting a lot of time and a lot of resources into trying to break into a network for for to the victim network, APT actors are actually buying initial access from cyber criminals on dark markets mostly, and. This is like a win-win situation for them, mostly because they don't have to wait a lot of time to find a vulnerability because somebody has already found it and they're just selling it. And of course, APD actors, they have like some uh, resources uh, either from stealing it, like uh, if it's like, for example, Dark Hotel, uh, which is like a Korean speaking APT, they, they steal a lot of cryptocurrencies, so they have money to buy access to in order to steal more money. Um, ransomware, which is huge these days. Um, I th would say it, it's the f like number one threat right now. Um, we have like ransomware groups and um, 
under market, underground markets being developed um, and more and more victims are being targeted by ransomware um, groups and basically they do extortion. They, they just um, get access to your network, they encrypt all your files and then they say, hey, you know, would you like to get, get, get your files back? If yes, pay us $5 million. And this was, this was, this was, it's what happened with the Colonial Pipeline, this is what happened with, um, let's say, Carmin, and many, many more, like FIFA, for example, as well. We have, like, um, like, um, EA Games. Um, we have, like, a lot of examples of, um, companies being targeted by ransomware or gangs. And APT actors, of course, they will follow the trend, they will try to use the same techniques, and of course, they will try to leverage whatever access possible in order to achieve their, their goals. Basically, we have like a bigger attack surface with more devices being connected to the internet, with um, more destructive, destructive attacks in the future, um, attacks which are can and possibly are um, able to disrupt an entire city or maybe an entire country or like a portion of like a, um, a country and deliberate attacks or collateral damage. Now this is an interesting topic because maybe you might not be the like sole purpose of like um, the target of the attackers but if you are part of uh, their, uh, their attack plan then you might be collateral damage. And I wanted to point out this last step, collateral damage, because this is an introduction into the supply chain attacks. But before we talk about supply chain attacks, let's actually talk about supply chain. What, what, what supply chain? And uh, researchers from um, <coughs> ENISA, uh, basically they published um, a paper which was, uh, was published on, uh, in July this year. It's called Threat Landscape for Supply Chain Attacks from ENISA. It's amazing, I would suggest you go check it out. I, I've put a link here in the QR code. In their 50 plus pages paper, they define and they, they talk about supply chain attacks, what happened in the past, what, um, what are the thoughts about the future. And I just want to mention some of the facts, key facts that they mentioned there. And in order to talk about attacks, we actually need to talk about like what's supply chain. And I think they have like a pretty good definition. It means like the ecosystem of processes, people, organizations, and distributors involved in the creation and delivery of final solution or product. Well, that's pretty cool. And we have four main main things. We have a supplier which provides some goods. It can be like um, digital. It can be like um, real life physical goods. Uh, the supplier creates something and then the supplier has some assets. Those assets are being used by the supplier and then they can be moved around. And then we have like clients which are mm, using or like um, consuming some of the assets that the suppliers are producing. And lastly, we have client assets which again can be like uh, digital or physical. Let's say a client has like computers, buildings, offices, these kind of assets. But also a client can have like a laptop, servers, and so on. So your, your life kind of, if I'm not mistaken, depends on a supply chain. And uh, we all, we are part of a, at least one supply chain. Either it can be like food or it can be like products or goods. So without supply chains, our world would not function today. So what's a supply chain attack? Well, it's simple. The idea is that an attacker knows that their victim relies on multiple suppliers. The attacker also noticed or maybe did some reconnaissance and noticed, saw that like the victim, it's not so easy to hack. Maybe it has like good defenses, maybe it has like um, a lot of uh, monitoring. So what, the, what does the attacker do? Instead of going for the victim directly, it goes for one of its suppliers. So the first attack is on a supplier that is then used to attack the target. 
A target can be a final customer or another supplier. It can be like in a chain, supplier of a supplier of a supplier and then over, over, over for a victim. So therefore, for an attack to be classified as, as a supply chain one, both the supplier and the customer, they have to be targets. The supplier will be, a will be a target in order for the attacker to infiltrate or to inject its um, malware, because we're talking about cybersecurity, to inject the malware into the uh, product that is going to be used by the, by, the, by the victim. And this is pretty, pretty interesting because if you think, if you think and if you make like a small napkin calculation, you will see that actually, for sure, your organization uses at least one supplier. It can be like um, software in software development. Maybe you're using like an editor, a text editor. Maybe you're using a, like a specific Linux distribution. Maybe you're using a specific cloud provider. For sure, you are using at least one supplier. And then. Let me show you an example, uh, again taken from, from the Threat Landscape and Supply Chain Attack uh, report with CodeCov. Basically, in um, 2017, 2018, CodeCov was, was hacked. But the attackers didn't want, didn't focus on the CodeCov company itself. No, they were going for another customer. But they knew that the customer was using CodeCov. So what did, did the attacker do? They managed, to, they managed to find a bug with the instances that CodeCov was running. They managed to get access to the instance. And then from, from that instance, they managed to inject a malicious bash script. So at this stage, CodeCov network was compromised. The attackers were, were managed to inject their own script into the bash, bash basically in, to inject their own shell code into the bash um, um, bash um, interpreter which was bundled into the images and then when the customer downloaded the infected malicious image the customer didn't know because the customer trusted it because it downloaded the image from a trusted source from code code so when the customer um, sp spun up the image like um, built the image the attackers, through the modified bear script, they managed to get access to the client credentials, and then from there, with those credentials, they managed to access the private Git server, getting access to the source code of the client. So this was this is how the customer got attacked. This is just an example. There are numerous examples of, um, and we will be discussing some of them a little, a little bit later. Now, you might say then. What's the like uh, history of attacks? And we see that um, the earliest attack is from 2003. Um, the earliest known attack or documented, because we we don't know exactly um, documented one. Maybe nobody knows about them. We have like some Gentoo and Fedora servers which were illegally accessed, and then attackers um, deployed some some malware on them. Now I'd like to give you some examples of um, uh, like. Later examples from 2000, from the 2000 years, 2010, we have this RSA, and I, I'm using one. Maybe you're using one as well. Are those RSA RSA tokens, and um, in 2011 there was like a huge uh, news saying that the security from RSA offered to replace those tokens because it got hacked, and then the big question was, is RSA the final victim, or actually attackers are going after somebody else? And then, uh, how did the hack happen? It was on um, zero day, you know, attached in an XML file, uh, XLS file, sorry. And basically, in, a, in Excel, somebody uh, got the email, um, and then the employee executed the spreadsheet, and then from there, the attackers managed to infiltrate the network. So this is not like unheard, and it's like it, it is what it is. But then. Um, the uh, RSA uh, chairman, uh, executive chairman, said that uh, information taken from RSA in March had been used as an element of attempted broader attack on Lockheed Martin. Initially, Lockheed Martin did not did not uh, confirm that they were also a target, saying they were in breach. But our RSA executive chairman said that um, the hack on, on, on its company actually tried to impact its customers. 
And of course, you might know that Lockheed is one of the world, world's largest suppliers of weapon systems, fighter jets, and warships. So this was pretty interesting back then. And then we have another hack, like two years later. And then Bit9, which was actually, um, which acquired Carbon Black, which then was, was acquired by uh, VMware in 2018. And now it's kind of called via, um, Carbon Black. But um, in the past days, if you might, if you are familiar, if you work in cybersecurity, you you heard for sure about Bit9. It's a, like a whitelisting solution in order to make sure that no um, no binaries um, except the ones which are whitelisted are executed on a Windows platform. And basically, they got hacked. And the question, and they said that you know, like um, only three customers were affected by illegitimately, illegitimately signed malware because the attackers managed to get access to the signing servers. So <clears throat> this was interesting because the company said that it actually its clients are like U.S. military intelligence agencies, five of the top ten aerospace and defense com defense companies in the Fortune 500. So this was pretty big because um, again. Same as RSA, the attackers were not going directly after like Bit9, but they were actually going for the clients. Okay, let's go a little bit later. Um, we are in 2017, and then you might have heard about the Shadowpad APT. Um, so my colleagues in Kaspersky, they found a high, <coughs> like um, APT, high-end APT implant, in, implant hidden in a management software during initial, uh, initial response. Basically, uh, we have this like... Um, um, we have this um, NetSarang uh, company which was providing um, a software and it got hacked and their, their, their products were being replaced and signed with, their, with, with a valid certificate but the products themselves were distributing malware. So we did some research, we analyzed it and then there was this an another hack like almost around the same time where CC Cleaner got also compromised and users were downloading malicious compromised um, ver updates of CC Cleaner from the official website. And everybody was asking, so, oh, oh my god, who is behind these attacks and then what's happening? But one year later at Virus Bulletin, John Lambert from um, Microsoft Research, they um, proved and they, they, they mentioned that um, the volume APT was behind Shadowpad and NetSarang and CC Cleaner attacks which were earlier documented. So this is pretty pretty interesting. We have we have like the missing link. Um, we have an APT group which were targeting all this kind of um, software in order to get access to the, uh, the client. So basically a supply chain attacks. And then we have like this huge story of 2019. Maybe you were or maybe you weren't impacted. Basically, we found users started started um, like um, writing messages of an interesting uh, update for ASUS critical uh, ASUS uh, updater and first of all the binary itself had a typo it was like um, the name was weird but uh, also it was not detected as malware at all so um, people will say that it was legitimate but it was kind of shady you know and then we have like this uh, the name uh, like um, the spelling of force and the empty details are like kind of odd because ASUS, a legitimate software company, like uh, and hardware, they, they 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 have their software bundled, okay. But you know, like um, nobody knew nobody knew exactly what was happening. The file was clean, but we can see exactly that you know, like there's a typo, you know, force instead of force, and. You know, everybody was like, hey, you know, like, probably because ASUS is a German company, so they have these typos, or, you know, you know, like, maybe the file is clean. And then we were like, okay, sure. And then one, one of my colleagues found, interestingly found that in January 2019, we found some more updates. And then in those updates, we found that there was a file, a zip file, hosted at, a, like, a legitimate ASUS download server. But... The, um, the file itself having a valid signature from ASUS tech, actually it contained malware. So this was pretty big, this was pretty huge because we, uh, my colleagues, um, I, like identified that we are actually um, confronting with them, um, like they were investigating a supply chain attack and ASUS was a victim. 
So the binary itself was pretty interesting, but I don't have time in order to go like in depth details about it. Maybe may, at at a later time, um, I can uh, like I can point you to uh, to our um research or published paper which has like all the details available but the binary itself it was saved it was marked as creation day 2015 so that was like pretty interesting and one aspect i would like to tell you about this kind of this malware which was distributed from the asus update servers like the legitimate update servers is that it wasn't targeting all the users no it was targeting only with the, like surgical precision of 400 MAC addresses. So basically the malware once it got, um, once the update was downloaded from ASUS, then the malware was executed, and then it was checking for the MAC address of the system. And then the attackers actually had a list of 400 MAC addresses, like a bundle in the malware, and only if they, they detected that specific MAC address, the, um, the malware was getting the second stage, like global.jpg, and then it was executing uh, the second um, second stage payload and infecting the, the computer with more more um, like ex binaries. Out of those 400 MAC addresses, we've seen like more than 270 are like from ASUS tech, but it's interesting to see that we also have like some Huawei devices, one MAC address belong to a Huawei uh, device, and also TP-Link and um, <coughs> Realtek. So the attackers kind of knew which were, what their, victim, what their victims were, and we don't know exactly who those victims are. So if you have like uh, information about like those MAC addresses, like you're welcome to, 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 to ping us. So the story doesn't end here. Um, again, if we look in, at the uh, NSA report, we see that in 2021 only, and it's like this year didn't finish yet, we have like a lot of attacks. And you might have heard about the huge, now like so well-known uh, attack about like on SolarWinds with their their Orion software. But you might have heard about also Kaseya or um, the Apple X Code, which is um, an interesting an interesting um, uh, let's say attack, and we will be discussing it a little bit later. Also, I was directly impacted by one of the supply chain attacks on a Cita website. Basically, um, airlines are using CETA website in order to handle passenger information. And because uh, CETA was um, like attacked, I also got um, got uh, Im impacted by this attack because of the Singaporean airlines, which were like cooperating with uh, SITA. Well, what I, what I wanted to show you is that um, once a supply chain attack happens, and if you run and if you execute the binary on your computer, then you you will get infected with uh, malware which is pretty pretty complex. So if we look back at the Shadowpad uh, attack that I mentioned earlier, we see that it's actually just a reconnaissance tool with a backdoor allowing the attackers to actually snoop on your on your device, see if their device is interesting enough in order to further um, backdoor it and further exfiltrate information from it. The model itself is able to detect Windows, Windows versions from 95 to Windows 10, which was like huge at that time. And of course, it has an option to download files, to run files, and to uninstall itself once the attackers uh, are finished with, um, like identifying your computer. So the model itself is pretty complex. But we also have some cases where Supply chain attacks are actually not proven to be like uh, false or proven not to be like uh, what they are presented to be. And you might have heard about the huge story in um, actually almost three years ago in October 2018 with the uh, Supermicro uh, servers which had like a tiny chip implanted by a China, by a, like a, <coughs> they say, or Chinese spies, but actually researchers and people tried to look into it. Um, Joe Fitzpatrick, uh, he actually said that uh, I want to see the schematics, I want, I have the tools to analyze it, and it turns out that um, the, the pictures we were given were like actually like um, 
template rendering, so the pictures we were given were not, like, were not useful. The sources in the article were actually not mentioned, not like on, were anonymous sources, and the entire story, um, it act, it like there's a 80% or 90% chance to be like um, fake news. It it wasn't substantiated. There there's no like real basis of uh, of of this uh, of the news. So basically, it was a waste of time, but it was cool because it was a supply chain on hardware. Of course, not all not all the supply chain uh, um, stories are fake, and the main reason we have we've seen supply chains being mounted in, in uh, currently is because we have like pretty good defenses. We have like uh, antivirus, we have like firewalls, we have like uh, EDR, XDR, we have like whitelisting, etc, etc, etc. So basically the attackers, they need to find new ways in order to actually infiltrate or penetrate the networks of their order victims. And high-end high actors will try, will always have a way to reach the target but medium and low, uh, low tier, act, uh, tier uh, actors actually they will try to either move along or they will have to find new options and supply chain attacks are interesting because you don't have to go for the uh, attacker itself you have for the victim itself you can actually go for the supplier maybe the supplier has a, like not so much not so good security or um, it's mm, it's like it doesn't have like a really good security team and why is it hard to discover supply chain attacks well because they abuse the existing existing trust the attackers once infiltrating the network they can hide uh, in the shadows they can inject their malware into a, into a code which will be then signed with the certificates which will the software will be trusted in the in the chain further uh, further up and then there's like this huge confusion because for example in the WannaCry people were saying like install the patches and then like for the middle which was like Ukrainian Ukrainian supply chain attack which happened in 2008, 2017, 2018 um, <clears throat> Uh, Midoc softwares were compromised and they were distributing um, not petty ransomware and people were selling do, saying do not install the patch because you're gonna get infected so <laughs> it's gonna be like crazy that's true but what if you manage to inject a backdoor and the code is clean well you know the code will get like digitally signaled, uh, signed automatically the injection looks like maybe the developer tried to create it on purpose but the source code review doesn't show anything because the injection is like at higher level in the CI CD build so it's very important to make sure that if you are a company which creates or distributes software not only your your developers have to be like uh, secure and they have to have like really good security practices in order not to introduce bugs in the software but actually the entire build chain your entire build chain needs to also be protected and of course um, the attackers they know which the, which are who are their victims and they also only plant there are cases where they only plant malware into select projects they will not uh, expose their code only uh, to the entire world and I because you are developing like a really good product at MariaDB and you have like a lot of developers we have like a lot of a lot of enthusiasts a lot of users of, um, of uh, software of like MariaDB um, servers I want to point out a supply chain attack that happened this year and it's not new Xcode, um, there were multiple instances of Xcode um, um, editor being um, injected with malware and being distributed. For example, in, um, in Southeast Asia, where um, there are, like, um, the internet connection is slower and then people prefer to download Xcode from like, uh, closer, like servers um, closer to that region. And then we've seen cases where there are like, trojanized versions of Xcodes were, were um, distributed, were released, and then like users unknown unbeknown users they were like downloading this trojanite version of xcode which was then compiling all the projects installing malware in them 
But this attack, which um, was uh, discovered by the Sentinel-1 this year, was actually different because <coughs> they uh, documented a way where the attackers were promoting a malicious repository. And the malicious repository is actually was top bar interaction, which was legitimate. From, from GitHub, a legitimate user created this project. The attackers cloned this project, and basically what they did, they added a few, few instructions in the build process for Xcode, such that if you downloaded this malicious uh, repository from like Git repository, if you tried to build it, then your Xcode would actually execute commands, and your com your computer would be you, you'd get your computer would get infected, the, allowing the attackers to get access to your computer. It was actually creating a reverse shell to their C2 server. So just by downloading the software and clicking the build button, which generates like a huge artifacts, the attackers would actually be able to own your your computer. And this is not new, like. Um, Google, dis um, Google disclosed in, in January that the um, North Korean uh, Lazarus hacking group was also conducting social engineering attacks against security researchers trying to make them run malicious co code on their computers. So this is not new. And then you might ask, you might say, Dan, what are the solutions? And I would say there are different types. There are different things you can do. For if you're a user, if you're not, if you're just using the software, you have to make, you you will have a trust chain. But when you when you have when you have the trust chain established, try to follow the trust chain. Try to see check the fingerprints of signatures. So, for example, on MariaDB, they provide packages where you can download the latest updates, latest MariaDB server packages. You can go to their website. You can install the repository on, your repository on your server and you can fetch the updates directly from them. But then, once you download anything from their website, also make sure that you verify the signature. Also make, make sure that you, you import their signing key and you, everything you download, you check to make sure that it's signed by them. Maybe you have like a man, man in the middle attack in your network and then the attackers redirected your download and it's not coming from MariaDB official servers, but it's coming from a server controlled by the attacker. Check the signature. And also you can limit the supply chain length. You can limit the number of vendors that you're using in your company. And also make sure that the vendors that you're using are actually, let's say, security conscious. Are doing like security, they have like a bug bounty program, they have like a security team, and they react fast to security uh, events which are happening in, in uh, like reported by users. So this is how the <coughs> information from MariaDB looks like. You have like all the information about like um, how to get access to the uh, to, to the bug bounty program, like where to get like the um, uh, the signing keys, their like um, email account in order to um, like. Um, <coughs> Tell them about like security bugs or to, to report bugs. And what about like what if you're a developer? Well, it's very important to make sure that the signing keys are secure. Once you release a software signed by you, then the, the entire world trusts that the software is clean. And this trust is like so easy to break if you get uh, get like if your if your signing keys signing servers are compromised. So you have to make sure that the signing keys and the signing servers are secure. You have to make sure that your build chain is also secure because <coughs> even though the code on your, uh, on GitHub is uh, is like properly validated with uh, pull requests and approvals and everything. If somebody goes in between the code and in the in the build chain between well, when the code is fetched and the package is built and inserts the malware, it's very hard to see. And also, developer machines are very important because they also have access to private Git repositories. They have access to the source code. Of course, for, more, for MariaDB, it's a little bit easier because it's open source, so all, so all the code is like out there available. But developer machines are important 
because they have they give access to further resources into the organization. And of course, bug bounty programs are really important for in order to people in order for white hackers to be motivated to report bugs. And I've seen that um, a recent article, which was published on, uh, on MariaDB Foundation, Challenges and Visions for MariaDB Server, and uh, I fully agree with the article, and I think it's really important that you, as a software, software company developing like, like a really good software, you have to have a way in order to have your builds to be verified and everybody to be able to build their own, uh, their own uh, from the source code, build their own tools, or to be able to reproduce the builds in order to identify any differences if, if there's like, uh, like some malicious code on, on, on the um, binary which was hosted on the update servers, on your update servers, and the, um, the software, the build that they created on their computer. So it's really important to have like this mindset and this um, forward going into the future of like uh, always updating your continuous integration um, and the delivery in order to make sure that you have like a really good software. And with this being said, thanks a lot for, for coming to my presentation. I hope it wasn't too long and I'm here to answer any of your questions. So thanks a lot. Uh, hi Dan, uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. I, I am Fosta. I am in charge of the infrastructure at MariaDB Foundation. We don't have a very big infrastructure, but we have a quite big and growing uh, uh, building uh, infrastructure for all the packages that we are uh, providing, all the binaries. Uh, this is made about cloud vendors uh, and very heterogeneous uh, machines uh, because we are building multi-arch uh, uh, binaries. So, so the question about the security of the building chain is, is really important to us. Um, as you as you mentioned, uh, user as uh, the the solution of of uh, well uh, verifying that every binaries that we that we provide them are signed by our keys, and there is another option uh, that you maybe not mentioned is about the, the the possibility to rely on the distribution and on the package management from the distribution. Um, on, on your your. Uh, um, uh, what you, what you, what do you suggest? What what is your your opinion on on, on uh, uh, using the upstream uh, binaries or relying on the distribution? What's what's your take on that? So uh, thanks a lot for uh, for <clears throat> giving me the opportunity to present at your at your uh, uh, conference. And um, this is a really good question. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think it has multiple options. Like from a user standpoint, it has multiple. You have multiple options. Myself, I'm a Linux user, I'm a Debian user, and of course, it's easier to just like go into terminal, like apt install uh, MariaDB dash server. But um, that package comes from the D official Debian repository. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, I think, um, and from what I've read, um, you also provide some um, Debian repositories which are more up to date and with the latest code. Yep. So now the challenge is, um, will the user um, manually want to manually add an extra APT source, um, APT repository, um, to fetch the latest um, Debian package for MariaDB from your official website? Or will the user um, not want to do that and just uh, download, download it from the uh, Debian repository or whatever other um, Linux distribution or Windows they're using? Windows is a special case because there are no like repositories. Let's talk about Linux yeah. here. <laughs> and <clears throat> from my point of view, I think there's like, um, the question is where do you put your trust in? Do you trust um, directly MariaDB? And then in this case, you should put your repositories to, f to download them directly from, uh, from the MariaDB repository. Or do you trust the um, Linux maintainer, which um, it might be or might not be affiliated to MariaDB. 
Um, and from what I've seen, there are multiple um, different different maintainers uh, for Fedora, for Arch, for Manaho, for, for Ubuntu, for Debian. Basically, those users, uh, I don't think, and maybe you can correct me here if I'm wrong, I don't think they're directly or officially affiliated to, to MariaDB, um, but rather they just uh, they, they maintain the, 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 um, t- the source code and they just publish new updates. Also, they might be... Um, late or they might be behind official updates uh, versus um, compared to the website yeah well so this this is this is in, indeed uh, true well it depends on all the distribution i i don't know uh, very well how it works for for fedora for instance mm-hmm. i i know the particular case of debian quite quite good the the the, the thing with with debian and ubuntu because we we provide packages from for debian uh, in the case of debian this is the same person uh, that that, that okay. maintains um, for ubuntu um, yeah, this is this is I think a, a good question. Either you want to rely more on Debian and you trust Debian because well, it's kind of a historically a, a, a trustful, in my and opinion, yeah. uh, uh, distribution. Uh, either you prefer to um, to to rely on MariaDB, and there is another aspect that uh, you mentioned that I think is quite interesting and uh, in, in important to take in consideration is if you uh, maybe. Uh, are more um, interested in, in having the updates uh, the, as soon as they are uh, provided uh, and the patches. I think in the case of Debian, uh, when there is a, a, a very problematic and really uh, impactful security patch, then, then it, it, it goes uh, much, much, uh, much faster than, than just for a new feature or something like that. But uh, yes, so, this, this, uh, I think I've seen um, this case, whereas from the upstream, from MariaDB upstream, um, an update would come faster than um, the one from uh, the official Debian repository. Yeah, um, yeah. I have yeah. another example uh, with, um, well, you know, like I'm using all kinds of browsers. I'm also using Google Chrome. It's exactly the same. Like uh, Chrome from uh, Debian is a little bit behind uh, with um, versus um, repository maintained by Google. And when there was a zero day in Chrome, and I was like, oh, okay, I have to update. I'm going to update my browser because like, um, the patch didn't arrive one day later than the one from uh, official Google repository, which they released it immediately. When they released the blog, mm. they also released the update. Yeah. They yeah, so this is... Yeah, of course. So yeah, this is this is a very important aspect to take in consideration. You you you're true. I, I had an, an, another question uh, because we are speaking about uh, relying on the on the distribution package management system or on MariaDB. Um, what about uh, building your own binaries? Uh, this is something we are trying to to make a, every time more easy. Uh, we are working, for instance, uh, these days a lot on, on, on providing Docker uh, containers so the people, the, the user, are able to, to test them more easily. Um, the, the building of MariaDB is quite long uh, because it's a big uh, piece of program but uh, this is not difficult to do it uh, do you know uh, users or i would say maybe paranoiac users or but if you are working in, in the financial uh, ecosystem uh, i guess some some users will rely only on the binaries that they are building well yeah uh, <clears throat> first of all it depends on um, how Mm, w- well set up your infrastructure is if you have like um like um opsec person who um just uh, knows how to has like an entire build chain and uh, downloads the source code builds it like pushes the updates to, the, to their server then it's uh, quite easy personally uh, i did that i did uh, download the source code and compile it myself i have a really good friend um, who says that uh, code never lies and um, <clears throat> the first thing, and it's the most important thing when you try to go on this path, is that you need to go to you need to download from the official source. So I think in your case, it's uh, GitHub. Um, I would add also that you should check, or maybe MariaDB should enforce, 
and I'm sure if that happens, um, that all the commits are signed, are cryptographically signed with the public key of the developers. So this is what we do in our organization. Um, everything that is pushed needs to be signed. If it's not signed, then um, basically the Git server rejects the commit, rejects the push. And uh, once you man you verify that all the commits are signed, uh, you verify you're, you're downloading the code from a trusted source, then you kind of established a root of trust. And then that code is trusted, hopefully. <laughs> and then you can compile it yourself on your machine. Now the question is, is the, question, the, stack, the next question is, is your build machine secure? Hopefully, uh, <laughs> that machine should be like um, disconnected from the internet. And then once you build it, and then you get like a uh, binary, you get um, <clears throat> the executable, you transfer it to the production machine, production machines, and then mm -hmm. you have like the, the, uh, the checks unchecked. And then like when the, there's an update, you go, go, then go again, down, download the code, put it on your build machine and do that. So it's a little bit harder than doing APT update and then you just <laughs> get the newest update of MariaDB. But uh, depends on how much time, how much money, and how, mu how much, um, how skilled your team is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is, this is of course, a bit uh, more difficult. But yeah, uh, for some actors, maybe this is, uh, this is something they, they, they should do. Uh, it's a very good point. Easy. Yeah, it's a very good point about the signing about our comments. This is a, a question I cannot answer at the moment, but I will I will raise this to 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 my colleagues. Uh, uh, this is maybe something we could improve uh, in, in the future. Well, so, um, uh, you're monitoring you're monitoring the entire commits, and like you will notice that if something is wrong, like immediately you can revert. This is, of course, of course, this is, of course, yeah, yeah, this is, of course, done. Uh, but uh, when we are speaking about signing the commits, this is maybe not uh, already the case. This is the only thing. It's an extra I layer. To... It's an extra layer. Yeah. You know, in security, yeah. it's always about adding an extra, extra, extra layers. You don't rely only on uh, your castle walls, castle defense. And then what happens if you get breached, then it's like game over. Mm -hmm. Now you have like um, your um, initial defense and then you have like an extra defense and have like guards and then you have like an extra monitoring system and then you have like some hidden monitoring system. You know, it's just <laughs> like security is like in, in layers. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think we are we are 30 seconds uh, past from our 10 minutes, but it uh, was very interesting. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.